May 25th meeting of the Planning and Sustainability Commission. I'm Eli Spivak. I'm chairing this meeting, and I believe Eric Engstrom is sitting in the officer, sorry, the director's seat today um, remotely. Thank you, Eric. Um, in keeping with the Oregon Public Meetings Law, statutory land use hearing requirements, and Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding this meeting virtually. All members of the PSC are attending remotely and the city has made several avenues available for the public to watch the broadcast of this meeting. The PSC is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, humor, flexibility, and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. Well, our meeting is called to order and I will see if there's any items of interest from commissioners. I see Chris. So I've got uh, one piece of unfinished business. I can't hear you though, Chris. Oh. Maybe that's my own phone. Uh, I good. can hear him, Eli, so it might be you. I can hear him <laughs> too. Yeah, sounds like they can hear me. Uh, so I have one piece of unfinished business that I wanna make sure I take care of before I leave the commission. Uh, and that's um, Southwest Corridor and particularly the West Portland Town Center. Uh, I have been uh, this commission's representative to the West Portland Town Center Stakeholder Committee. Um, obviously that project has taken a little bit of a different path without the passage uh, of the, the bond measure last fall. So the, the future of light rail in that quarter is uncertain. Um, you know, I signed up for, for a role kind of monitoring this corridor, corridor back when I uh, first joined the commission and I raised my hand for the Barber concept plan, which was the first broad look at how we would address light rail in the corridor and what that might mean for land use. Um, I, I did not think you know, I would leave 12 years later with sort of that still up in the air, <laughs> what was going to happen. Um, but you know, I'm happy that we have taken that seriously. You know, I learned from the experience of the failure of the North-South project and then coming back with the yellow line that was financed with urban renewal dollars that didn't leave enough uh, money to do effective uh, mitigation with affordable housing. And we saw a decade of displacement as a result. So uh, I'm glad that we've learned that lesson, that we have a plan for the corridor, uh, in particular that we have um, a very strong equity group working on that. And I'm kind of passing the torch to Oriana who has uh, integrated herself with that equity group in the quarter. And I'm delighted that she'll be looking after this after I'm gone. Um, a couple of thoughts um, as we think about the corridor. Uh, one is just to keep the, and you'll be asked to you know, adopt zoning for the town center probably sometime later this year. Was, we were gonna have a first briefing tonight, but you know, that's not happening. So I wanna make sure I get these thoughts out. Um, it's important that we keep the land use phased with the transportation improvements. So even if we're not doing light rail in the immediate future, there's an opportunity for bus improvements. Um, there's definitely a need to have better zoning in the town center, uh, but we just wanna think about keeping those things uh, somewhat synchronized with each other. So we don't you know, plop in a lot of housing without the transportation to support it. Um, certainly Southwest is an area that's uh, lacked good bike and ped facilities for a long time. And there's certainly an opportunity to continue to prioritize those even while we wait to see what happens with transit over the long run. Um, I think the other thing, uh, yeah, and I point out that, you know, we made a recommendation around this quarter that the city should establish a fund to do early acquisitions of potential affordable housing sites even before light rail is approved, well, that, that fund still has not been created. So there's still an opportunity for this commission to advocate with the city to make sure we put resources into making sure we make the corridor ready uh, for uh, high capacity transit development. Uh, and there will still be a need to coordinate all the different infrastructure bureaus. And I think BPS is in a strong role to, uh, uh, to convene the bureaus to make sure we do that in a coordinated fashion. So I hope BPS and this commission will keep their eyes in that corridor. Uh, it, it, it's not on the front burner at the moment, but it's still a, a, you know, a vitally important project for the long term. You know, when we think about the period of the comp plan or 50 year horizon, uh, this is definitely a corridor that we, uh, uh, we have to pay attention to. So I'll stop there. Oriana, over to you. Thanks. 
Thanks, Chris. And thank you so much for the leadership you've shown on this particular project over the years. Uh, I'm really excited to see the West Portland Town Center project and other future projects uh, that are supported by the Southwest Equity Coalition come before this body. I think it's been some really thoughtful development work that's learned lessons from some of the, the harm that's been done by other projects. Um, so excited to continue to, to represent and provide support. I kind of sit in this weird line where uh, my organization Verde is part of the Southwest Equity Coalition. Uh, and I sit as a technical advisor on some of the energy work they're doing, including a PSUF grant uh, that we successfully got to do energy planning, but then also with this body. So I try to walk that line effectively, but I'm excited to, to represent that space and support it on a number of levels. Thank you. Thank you both for your service on this, leading on this. This is not a project I've tracked well at all. So it's great to have other commissioners um, leading. Um, any other items of interest? Um, Jeff. Uh, yes, I'm unmuted. I just want to very quickly and publicly thank all the commissioners who took the time to write letters, emails to the mayor, city council, supporting my reappointment. So thank you for that. I'm flattered. And I promise each of you that when I do retire from the board, no one has to say a nice thing about me again. So thanks again to everybody. Thank you. Any other items? Okay, um, director's report, Eric. Thank you, Eli. Um, I'm sitting in for Andrea and Joe, who are both unable to make it tonight. Um, a few uh, quick updates. Um, uh, first, uh, thank you, Chris, for your continued leadership on Southwest and many other transportation related projects. I'm glad I happened to be here on your last last PSC meeting. Um, uh, and just as a segue from Southwest, uh, as Chris noted, we moved the briefing out a little bit. We're, uh, we, we've adjusted the schedule to go a little later, um, mostly to accommodate continued director discussion of some of the infrastructure coordination issues in the town center. As Chris mentioned, it's important to connect the dots there and, then, and that's what we've been working on. And uh, we still have a little more work to do to get it to the place where we're ready. Um, so, but that will be coming uh, later this year. Um, DOZA, as, as many of you know, council held a hearing on the May 12th. Um, there were about 50 people there, I believe, and, and over 200 pieces of written testimony. Um, the top two issues, uh, I believe, are the 75-foot uh, height threshold for triggering design review or use of the standards, and then the, there's continued discussion about what type of affordable housing project should be able to use the type two versus type three process. Um, so that's uh, going on. Uh, council's discussion, uh, I believe, will continue tomorrow. Um, uh, with sheltered housing continuum, um, a quick update, as you know, council adopted that on the 28th of April. Uh, the notice of adoption was sent uh, on Monday this last week. As far as I know, no one has appealed yet, but we're still in that time window. Um, and I'm also working with the county commission to schedule their um, consideration of it. As, as some of you know, we administer the zoning for unincorporated urban areas on behalf of Multnomah County. And so they actually have to adopt our zoning changes as well, um, usually after council does. So that's the next step with that project. Um, and finally, I, I believe you're all aware, but we're uh, at our next meeting, we'll be welcoming the three new members to the commission. Um, Janelle Bell, Erica Thompson, and Gabe Showships. Um, and uh, once again, thanks, uh, Chris, for your service. Thank you, Eric. Um, next, we have our consent agenda. Someone would like to make a motion to approve the minutes from our May 4th meeting? Well, if I could make my last motion, uh, I will move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Well, I'll second it. Thank you, Katie. Um, so um, all in favor, raise your hand. Fantastic. The minutes are adopted unanimously. And our first, today we've got two topics. Um, and I think I see people from both topics online right now. We've got Albina Vision Trust. And after that, Streets 2035. And we're going to open with Albina Vision Trust. And I think Winter is going to be presenting that, although I'm not sure if I'm going to jump to that conclusion. Um, welcome. Did I guess that right, Winter Johannes? Are you going to bring us up to speed on the Albina Vision Trust project? 
Eli, it's Rachel Hoy with um, Rachel. your playing at Sustainability High. Um, I believe Winta is on the line. Um, Winta and uh, Johannes and Janet Bebb from AVT should be here. I saw Janet. Um, and they hey, Hi, Rachel. Oh, hi there. And if you're all queued up, I'll just turn it right over to you, Winta, to get started. All right. Thank you. And sorry to come in at the last minute. Um, today is a big day for us uh, with news that we've uh, um, just announced around a partnership with Portland Public Schools around planning for the future of their site. So that hearing is right after this one, but let's jump into it with um, the discussion at hand. And so Janet, have you had a chance to introduce yourself and your role? No, I haven't. Uh, I'm Janet Bebb. I'm um, project manager with Albina Vision Trust and uh, specifically on the project that we're going to talk about tonight, which is called the Community Investment Plan. So I'm delighted to be here and thank you all for your service. Thank you. So uh, I had a chance to present um, and talk with all of you a few months ago when we were really at the beginning of the community investment plan work. And in that presentation, it was really an introduction of the plan and how we were thinking about approaching this next, um, the next set of planning activities for the district. Since then, we are now uh, over the halfway point. And so wanted to come back tonight and appreciate the invitation to share what we've learned from the process and where we see this uh, moving forward over the next few months and, and um, beyond that as well. And so I'd like to share my screen here. And I think. I just I made you a co-host. I, I just made you a co-host, so you should be able to share now. Thank you. Let's try that again. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, let me get rid of this message from Zoom. Zoom in here. So, you know, we started um, our last presentation with just an overview of Lower Albina and really how this work started. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but for any new folks to the conversation, just to ground us in a little bit of context, the albino vision work is about transforming the 94 acres of, of the lower um, albino neighborhood in the central city. And it's always important to be grounded in the history of what happened in that place, because that is the very root of our work is how do we take the lessons and our understanding about the neighborhood's history and use it to chart a different path forward. Um, and so you can see here images that will be familiar to some of you who have been tracking our work. Uh, you know, in the upper um, image is a, an aerial image of the neighborhood when it was intact and in many ways a good example of the kind of mixed use and thriving neighborhoods that we talk about designing now. Um, you can see some of the images in the bottom that show what life was like in this neighborhood, which is where uh, most of the city's African-American residents lived because of redlining and the displacement after uh, the Vanport floods. So people came to Albina um, to work uh, the industrial jobs that were there. And, you know, even though they were here because of the policies that confine them to this part of the city, there is a real sense of community that was created and the neighborhood was significant to the city and the state, both for its cultural contributions and also what was happening civically. So, you know, the city's uh, tree planting initiative, for example, we believe to have been burst in Albina. Um, there's a rich, of course, uh, history of jazz. Um, and soul music in the area and, and more that um, I would love to talk to you about, not in this presentation. So moving forward, we know then that there um, were a series of racist public policy decisions, right, that impacted the neighborhood, uh, including the creation of uh, the Mem Veterans Memorial Coliseum, the construction of I-5, 
the placement of the um, Blanchard site, which is now Portland Public Schools headquarters, all of these decisions impacted the fabric of the neighborhood, uh, leaving it unrecognizable. So you can see, and this image makes me feel emotional every time I see it, what is left of, of what were, you know, people's homes, communities, um, and so much more. And so the albino vision work comes from a place of understanding that you know, the ugliness of this part of the city today is really a reflection of the ugliness of the racism that has transpired there. And so if we know that development will occur in this part of the city, can we drive it to do something different than it has done in the past? And so here's just an aerial image of the neighborhood, just so that we all know the part of the city we're talking about, roughly between the steel bridge um, to north of the Broadway Bridge. This is the PPS site. Um, and then the river to I-5, which as you can see, has both physically and morally <laughs> dissected and pinched off Lower Albino from the rest of uh, the neighborhoods to the north and east. So the Albino Vision team came together six years ago now and laid out a set of values <laughs> that should drive what happens here. And you can see what they are um, and along with these values, I uh, did some work with Henneberry Eddy to show what these values might look like if placed on the um, physical site. So the um, image that you see on the bottom is, is uh, reflective of that. And since then, there's been a lot of support from Portlanders um, and beyond Portland, uh, from people who are interested um, and committed to thinking about what a project like this would mean both for the city, but also nationally where many of the forces that have destroyed Albina are common to black neighborhoods all over the, the nation. The construction of freeways, the placement of civic stadiums, the intentional um, exclusion of, of black uh, people from planning processes, all of these things are uh, not unique to Portland, though they have certainly played out in Albina in a very particular way. And so we, um, with this grounding, took an important step last year to pull together a design team to say, how do we move from a framework vision that we have today to something that um, has a greater level of detail. And um, so the thinking was to pull together a team of folks who represented uh, and brought a lot of different types of expertise um, and encouraging them to help us uh, move towards development scenarios. And one of the architects of how to pull together a team like this was Janet. And so I'll pause here and let her say and invite her to say a few words about um, the team and, and how they were pulled together to do this scope of work. Yeah, uh, the, thank you, Winta. The team is really special and we took a long time with it. We issued a, 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 a sort of traditional RFP with a scope of work we were interested in and the response was good. But what we were looking for um, is what eventually we pieced together after eight months, which was national expertise, local expertise, and a, a majority of black consultants. In architecture, as you all know, that, that is difficult, but the team is led by El Dorado, um, Josh Shelton, who's in the lower left picture. The economists are Mark Norman, in the upper left, and Mike Wilkerson, Eco Northwest. Many of you know Mike. For community engagement, we're deeply embedded in the Black community here with Kayeen and Cleo Davis. Um, and we also have a national expert, Othello Meadows, uh, who is in the middle next to Cleo, uh, who does development in Black communities and is a very engaging person. So we put together, oh, I forgot Bree Hensel with agency, a landscape architect and planning in the Boston area. A woman owned firm. So we came up and we have Rukaya and Winta here as, as key to our team too. So outstanding team uh, and have done some exciting work. Um, yeah. Thank you, Janet. And so in our last um, time together, we talked about uh, the way that this team's work uh, was designed for each discipline to inform and transform each other's. And so that meant a really 
a much more interactive process, uh, both internally as we're preparing for these workshops, but also um, in the actual workshops that are being presented to the community. So what you can see here, and this is from the last uh, workshop, is that we've uh, put together a series of sort of more formal workshop spaces, but then um, joy initiatives where we're inviting people to come in and express to us in different ways what's important to them. Uh, and so what have we heard over the last, I don't know, five months now um, can be distilled. And I know this image is painful on your eyes, so, so we will share it out um, and just talk through some of the highlights. Uh, and before I get to that part, um, you know, what's been really uh, enjoyable for me, and I'll invite Janet to chime in as well, is really uh, in how we've asked people about what uh, the ways that we've asked people about what's important to them. We've had, you know, children draw for us uh, islands that represent the, the things that are important to them. We've had um, people um, engage with us through storytelling. So it's been this really dynamic process. And at each stage, we've said, is this right? Did we hear you correctly? And is how we are organizing what you are hearing making sense to you? So there are five themes um, that have come forward. One is, you know, it's important that we create a strong sense of belonging in the neighborhood. Um, the second is that there be a rich variety of public spaces. Third, that there be wealth built within the Black community for the access to nature is important, and five, that shared social support and our thinking about it through this process is also important. Um, and so the team then, I think, cleverly <laughs> separated out um, places and experiences, again, to help us think about how do we take this feedback and organize it into places um, that will ultimately make up the development scenarios. I would just I would just add to that, Winta, that um, those of you who who are steeped in the design process know that uh, there's usually a, a programming phase, and we are led by an architecture team in the consultants. But the the programming phase was really listening to people and coming to this point, and we took eight months to get to this point, not drawing anything, no no architectural drawings to this date. The end game is three scenarios, uh, and so that is the intention. But taking a long time with this part. I think has reaped a lot of benefits for us. Agreed. Um, and so Janet, do you want to talk a little bit about the hubs and is, and how they relate to the experiences and places people have talked about? Yeah, you know, we got such rich content of, from people about their lives and what's important to them. And it came, it came out that as they remembered Albina or their favorite neighborhoods uh, today, it really is about diversity of experiences. And people talked a lot about food and they talked a lot about entertainment, art, health, wellness, and education. And so each of those topics felt like a cluster. And so we began calling them hubs as if um, those topics could be gathered together, perhaps in a building, and form uh, the diversity of experience, the richness that people were looking for. Thank you. And this way of organizing um, the feedback and our approach raises really important questions about, you know, what kinds of structures would then be needed to actually implement these um, these projects. And so. Uh, let me just walk you through some of the hubs. Um, and these were uh, drawn, I think, by agency, right, Janet? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, um, you know, again, reflecting the kinds of places with comments uh, directly from the community. And for each workshop, uh, you know, we host each workshop three times. The first one is uh, intended for Black community members only. And then we have two that are open to everybody. Um, but there's been an, an interesting amount of sort of continuity in, in the kinds of things that people are saying are important to them. Um, and so on the topic of a uh, rich variety of public spaces, you know, we hear things like um, wanting to make sure that, that public spaces and nature 
also nurture the sense of belonging, uh, that, you know, these are family-friendly spaces, uh, that there are ways that they can honor memory, um, history, and traditions. And so then, you know, the team is starting to think about, you know, what are multiple ways to get to this value, uh, whether it's through community gardens, playgrounds, um, or different ways that that may show up. And within each hub, Janet spoke to this, um, it's important that there be a variety of places accomplishing um, multiple objectives. Um, and so with that, let's look at some of the hub concepts that have come forward. Um, the first around commercial and entrepreneurial spaces. Janet, do you wanna take a start at this one? Um. I would say uh, just the comment that as we considered commercial and entrepreneurial spaces, we talked about everything from startup, food carts, working at home, all the way through um, internationally uh, significant businesses. So not making any judgment about where people found themselves in that. We heard all that range of spectrum. And I would just say too, you can see that we're crossing disciplines. This, this is starting to look a little like architecture, but the word sense of belonging and wealth built within the black community, those are the experiences that are really leading the architecture here. Yeah, and you can see, you know, in these images, the specific um, experiences that uh, have come up like the pitch night. Um, which is, you know, a pitch event for Black entrepreneurs. And those have come from the JOY initiative. So, you know, we had one in, in the fall that was focused on entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so all of this is embedded and I think reflective of how it was uh, set up to be. Um, and so, of course, we talked a lot about housing as well. And with housing, um, you know, there's one... Um, thread that was interesting, which is that, you know, schools should be everywhere. And so what if we think about schools and housing and uh, the ways that we can intentionally create communities? Um, and again, here, you know, you see housing linked to green space. Generational wealth came up um, as, as a really important value. And so I'm going to breeze by um, the next few ones, and I'm cognizant of time and want to make sure we have uh, opportunity to answer your questions and engage in, in discussion. You're getting the shortened version of, you know, what is a two hour workshop. <laughs> and so uh, encourage you to come to the workshop if you find this interesting as well. So one of the topics that we started to cover in the last set of workshops is really you know, what is the difference between how a typical uh, planning process is uh, approached and what is different about what ABP is doing through this process? Um, and for us, it's really that we are leading with wealth building as opposed to, you know, looking at the site and what is uh, possible and desirable for um, the developers and the economics of the site. And so, uh, with that, the stage that we're at in conversation is looking at, you know, if our approach is to lead with wealth building, what are the tools that we need to think about? And what does that mean for the possibilities in terms of uh, how the site can be um, designed? And so we'll jump into that, but want to pause for Janet. Um, I would just say that the, the wealth building uh, door that we're going through was really um, emphasized in all that eight months of communication with the community. We heard lots of things and those those values, but wealth building was really underlying all of it. And so we we definitely have said, what if we looked at architecture through wealth building? And so now we'll see what that looks like. Yeah, and as a part of this, you know, more participatory planning process, it's been important for the community to have access to, um, especially the folks are on our economics team who have made it a point uh, to really use these workshops as opportunities to share knowledge about these various tools. Um, and so we've talked, you know, we talk a lot about home ownership as 
the primary mechanism for uh, establishing uh, generational wealth and for good reason, um, considering how wealth is created in this country. But, you know, how do we also start to think about different models uh, and, and different tools? So um, this was the topic of, of earlier workshops, and now we started blending it with the architecture. So let me pause here. And so what we wanted to do in this workshop was not um, – not choose right a specific density that would govern you know that there would not be a certain type of uh, density that's assigned to to the neighborhood, but really to think about how does each density facilitate different types of wealth building tools, and given that we're looking at 94 acres, um, could there be a mix, and how do we strategically think about that to accomplish different objectives, um, and of course each scale comes with different trade-offs. And so, you know, how do we start talking about those things before uh, moving into scenario development? And so, as I said, this is intended really to be a spectrum of possibilities, um, but it's important that people are starting to think about, you know, the differences between um, each possibility. And before I move on to the character zone, Janet, anything you want to add? I think that what we took undertook in this workshop, as Winta said, was talking about wealth building and how it relates to development. And, and naturally, the question of density comes up, what the community has in their mind, maybe single family housing that was there once. But you'll see as we go forward that, that we took on this somewhat complicated topic and made it in a way that the community can embrace and understand. So let's just go forward and look at those. Um. And so as we do that, you know, it's important to be reacquainted with the site um, and to think about how the different parts of the site, you know, might facilitate different kinds of, of possibilities. Um, and so with low density, you know, this one speaks, of course, most directly um, to the sense of community that people talk about. Um, and so that is, that is a form of wealth that we should think about. Um, but it also is the tool that is, um, that is best set up for um, home ownership and wealth that can be created through home ownership uh, for small scale entrepreneurship, uh, as well as uh, smaller scale contracting opportunities um, and business development. And so we took that and did it and measured it against the wealth building goals. And so, you know, the purpose of introducing these kinds of metrics is really to establish that each possibility or each scale of density will come with trade-offs, right? And so how do we think about that um, as on, a, on a spectrum? So as I mentioned, this um, with low density in, the, in terms of development, um, you know, you maximize the amount of development and construction opportunities. Um, but in exchange, uh, you also uh, might have less shared green space. Um, the amount of wealth that, that the low density, not scenarios, but possibilities create uh, is limited, right, to the number of people who could live there um, as opposed to the other, um, the other scales. On... When we think about median density, this is the one that facilitates the rich variety of public spaces. Um, the, you know, the idea of, of in-between spaces has come up quite a bit. Um, and so you can have a mix of different uses. Um, and, uh, and so with that, measuring it again against the same um, types of uh, wealth building tools, we see that it delivers something a little bit different. 
you know, with medium density, you may be able to start looking at um, how to establish ownership interests in the development uh, that can be shared. Uh, there are greater opportunities for income generation and the community resources that have come up through this hub model. This is also, um, I think our team would admit, the one that is hardest to pull off, uh, especially given uh, the complexity of the kinds of financing tools and partnerships that you would need to be able to, um, to execute. And then finally, with the high density option, this one, uh, you know, created a lot of interesting um, conversation because high density is so easily associated with gentrification. And so thinking about, you know, how uh, how could high density scenarios actually generate wealth that is shared um, as opposed to extracted um, is important. And I imagine a conversation will continue to have. Um, and so with that, I'll just quickly get to the metrics. You know, again, you might have uh, more people who can access the wealth that's generated from a high density um, scenario, but the um, immediate opportunities for smaller businesses and contractors might not be the proportion that they can take advantage of. And so with all of this, uh, you can see, you know, them in one graphic, but What's important is that, you know, the purpose of this conversation and this framing is not to say one is good or one is bad or, you know, which which of these will drive the this, this scenarios that are ultimately being um, developed, but really had to say to the community and with the community, how can we use these tools um, to deliver a spectrum of possibilities on the site. And so um, the team started to play with that a little bit, right? You might have higher density, you know, in some places um, that are, you know, closer to uh, to the arenas, uh, whereas you might have lower density, um, you know, closer to the neighborhood. So this is all uh, early and, and really the important jumping uh, off point for the next round of workshops um, and and work that the team will do. So with that, I will stop sharing. Janet, any last words before I open it up for questions? No, I'm interested to hear what people's questions are. I am too. So yes. thank you so much, um, Winta and, um, and everyone for presentation. And I will um, ask if my commissioners have questions. I'm going to jump in with an ignorant one just to get things going. Um, this is a wonderful presentation um, with not a single mention of a highway, um, which I appreciate. Um, we just had a talk at the beginning of this meeting about a, a large planning project that just stalled out, at least for some amount of time, because funding didn't happen for a highway. Um, I mean, sorry, for light rail expansion. Um, if I-5 looks like it's not going to change at all going forward because of funding or whatever decisions, does your project get to continue moving forward? Yes. So, um, so you know, for the scenarios, we're going to ask our team to move forward um, with the option that includes the covered highways, uh, with the highway covers that we've been advocating for for a few years. You know, but the important thing is that you know, development in Lower Albina can happen with or without the highway covers. What's really at the question is really how does that highway um, impact the actual livability of the neighborhood is a really important question for us. And then, you know, aside from the practical concerns, what does it mean morally that we have this gash right through the center of the central city? And then are we really going to decide as a city that we are not going to do anything about that and, and you know, while there's this rebuilding of, of the neighborhood? So it's a complicated topic, and I won't take us down the I-5 uh, rabbit hole in this discussion, but we plan to move forward with, um, with our work no matter what. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to go to my view here where I can see who raised their hand first. Oriana, you're next. I think Chris was ahead of me. 
Oh, okay. Oh, no, you can go first, Oriana. It's fine. Great. Uh, thanks for coming back uh, to share more about the project and the, the participatory data that you gathered. I'm curious if uh, you have any thoughts as a project team on what you'd like to see this body advocate for to ensure that there are more planning efforts, not just happening at the community level, but through the city that utilize uh, more participatory uh, type research or, or planning approaches uh, to, to ensure that we're, we're effectively addressing wealth building in different communities and addressing the needs and desires of communities in ways that are really, really community led. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Oriana. You know, I have sort of two immediate thoughts. One is that we have found this model of working with the city to be really effective. Um, and so, you know, would leave that as an open question to the city. Is this, is this a model that you would want to try out in uh, different parts um, with some of the other efforts? I don't know, but it's, it's a question. Um, in terms of how this body can support us in the Albina vision work, though, you know, we'd love to be invited to come back uh, in June, at the end of June or early July, when we have draft scenarios and can start talking in detail, for example, about what in the Central City 2035 plan may um, need to be revisited. I think we can have a more sort of specific conversation at that point. And so, you know, we jump at that opportunity. You know, I don't have I don't have much to add except to say that I think the the magic in this work has been um, in the the way we've done engagement. It's deeply embedded in the community. It is really of the place, and our our engagement specialists are not generic engagement specialists. They're community members, and I think that has been huge. I don't know how you advocate for that except for genuine and authentic conversations. And then I think that that we're getting more facile with leading with with values and leading with in our case it's leading with the value of wealth building which came out of the community so be hesitant to draw until you till you see that uh, how the values are playing out and make sure that architecture is in service to the values as opposed to leading. Thank you. Um I've now got um, Ben, and then I've got Chris, and then Jeff. So Ben. Thank you. Um, no questions for me, just uh, a handful of comments. Um, I'm really, really uh, glad to see the wealth building the relating, uh, relating to development. I think that's a, a great way to lead with this project um, as, a, as a real uh, uh, way to benefit and perhaps do uh, amends with some of the wrongdoings of the past. I think that's, that's, that's really, uh, that's got a lot of potential. And I think the key uh, team members that you have will help you with that. I think you got some good, good team members there. Um, as far as the, um, the approach from a pure urban design standpoint, I'm also uh, very positively impressed. I think you know, you talked about urban renewal, red lighting, some of the big infrastructure cutting through all the, the, the wrongdoings of the past. Part of that was also uh, from a purely design standpoint, really a kind of a monoculture, which was very typical of that age of, you know, you just wipe everything out and have the architects kind of lead. I really like what you uh, just said, where, you know, you, you, you basically kind of do the opposite. You really uh, have architecture in service of this. I think this is really uh, a great uh, opportunity to do that. And I think kind of going back to the non-monoculture is really the, the, the mix of uses, the mix of densities, the mix of housings that you can have here can be really, really deliberate. And, I, and if I could put a plug in from some of the work that, you've, that we've done as a body uh, uh, recently, the residential infill project, I see this as a as a, perhaps a good place where some of those ideas can be implemented, where even at the very small scale, what we used to look at as single family could actually have up to six units. I think there's an opportunity there to really embed that density and that livability and create that wealth in something that can, can look and feel like a real neighborhood with that embedded variety. So 
All words of encouragement. Look forward to see what you come up next. Um, um, really good work. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, Chris. Well, Winter, let me offer my congratulations on your partnership with the school district. That's fantastic news. Uh, and as you know, I've, I've sat in as a fly on the wall on some of your workshops and been very impressed with that process. Um, uh, two thoughts uh, about the density question. Um, one is that, of course, because most of this land is within the central city, our policies are going to bias towards higher density answers. And I would encourage you, if at any point you know you think our policies are getting in the way of what you think is best for the ultimate future of the Black community, you know, please come and dialogue with us. Um, I'd also just mention that for the the medium density scenario, there is legislation working its way through the legislature that I think may happen this session that would make it simpler to have fee simple ownership of some of those middle housing types. Mm -hmm. um, so that may, you know, maybe that factors in your calculations somewhere. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to beg your indulgence to take us down the freeway rat hole just for a, a limited purpose. Uh, you know, my colleagues will know that I'm involved uh, in a group that's uh, opposing the widening of the freeway through Albina, uh, including uh, two lawsuits at the moment. Um, but, you know, and AVT walked away from that the ODOT process because it was so bad and, and you were immediately followed by the city and the county. But the question I want to ask is about the independent cover analysis that's happening right now. And I've actually been somewhat impressed that by the independence of that process. I, I had assumed ODOT would keep that pretty tightly bound so it couldn't disrupt their plans, but um, I could tell it, it, it is independent because ODOT's getting nervous. Um, <laughs> and there are some really intriguing ideas about how you unlock potential in the community by moving the freeway ramps around, uh, which I think is exciting to think about. Um, but I'm a little bit cautious in watching that discussion because it's, a lot of it is about that central area that would be capped right around the broadway Weiler corridor. But the choices being made have implications for both the Blanchard site and for uh, what happens up towards the Moda Center, which are still within the area you're looking at. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that because the city sort of joined in your walkout, nobody from the city is at the table as those issues are being worked about. And, and you know, uh, I'm the last person in the room who was here for this process. But back in 2012, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to promote access to the Blanchard site. Uh, and some of those factors are kind of getting swept away. So I guess I'd like to ask your advice to the city. Uh, is there a useful role to the city for the city to play in this independent cover analysis while still supporting you know, ABT's approach to the, the overall process? Yeah, well, thank you, Chris. Um, so, you know, the question, so I agree with you, right? The concept that the ZGF team have put forward through the independent analysis are really good. And particularly, you know, the ones that remove uh, that move the interchanges south um, and create the kinds of developable highway covers we've been talking about, we're excited by. Um, I think that the moment of truth will be in these next few weeks. You know, will ODOT move forward <laughs> with those concepts or, <laughs> uh, or will they not? And so I could see the city being particularly helpful in advocating for those more developable highway covers, um, you know, those concepts that the independent cover team have put forward. And, you know, the, the cloud that's existed over this project, at least from our perspective, is that there's always been a question of whether they will move forward with the uh, comprehensive covers. If the answer is yes, then I think many people would be all in and figuring out the technical details and how to make sure it's done well. But until this question of whether they will do it or whether they will try to sort of strong arm this, you know, the terrible overpass uh, masquerading as caps <laughs> scenario, then um, then we're stuck. So I hope I hope to see some movement in the next few weeks. Okay. Well. While I won't be able to partner with you uh, on that in my commission role, I look forward to continuing to do so in my personal advocacy role. So thank you. Thank you, um, Chris and um, Jeff. Uh, thank you. If you, I've edited down my list of questions, just a few, which I'll make it brief. Um, 
First, of the 94 acres, how much is in some form of public ownership? So the major uh, property owners in the district are the city of Portland, um, the school district uh, are the two biggest public owners. Um, and then, so, you know, maybe of the 10, there are 10 to 12 property owners overall. Um, but when you take out the, you know, Vulcan, um, and the trailblazers, the city of Portland and the school district, then you're left with, a, uh, you know, a lot of smaller ones. So Vulcan, school district, city are the majority of your 94 acres? Yes, and also, yeah, I mean, the thing about the district right now is that a lot of it is also parking lots and just, you know, uh, infrastructure. So, you know, the max uh, goes the Rose Quarter Transit Center is there. Um, you have the Union Pacific Trail or you know rail line that goes through there. So there's also a lot of infrastructure that's tied up in the district as well. Yeah. Is is there an operating assumption as you think about design scenarios and that the Blanchard site will be gone, that the Blanchard building will be gone, the school district will be gone, or is that still a a live issue that's being discussed? So our hope is that we would work with the school district to think about what the future of that site will be long term. Um, so the action that's happening at six o'clock today is that they will be authorizing the superintendent to sign a right of first refusal agreement with uh, AVP. Um, and so, you know, that begins to establish the partnership. But what we really want is the long term planning um, to happen together as well. And, and so there are no immediate, this isn't about, you know, immediate relocation or, or anything like that. So I also want to be clear uh, about that. Gotcha. And then finally, you, you know, you you talked about your three scenarios and I, I, I didn't see everybody on your project planning team, but do you have some developers with experience in sort of large master planned urban development? And if not, is there, where in your timeline might you bring them in to begin sort of ground testing or truth testing your, from a financial feasibility standpoint, your, your development scenarios? So we have, uh, you know, Othello Meadows, I think on our team brings that development perspective, but you know, the, what is happening parallel to the process is that we've convened a developer's advisory group, uh, which includes a number of people with different um, scales of development that they've done that are advising us uh, alongside the project. So they'll be helping with that as well. Um, and then on our team, both on our board and leadership council, we also have folks with the requisite development experience. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Great. Good luck. It's exciting. Thank you. I'm Valeria. Thank you. Um, no questions from my end. I just want to echo some of um, Ben's comments. Uh, great presentation. Um, and I saw, I think, one of the slides, although it was a little bit hard for me to read, but you had um, lease to own options, and I couldn't tell whether that was for housing. Um, I'm guessing it is, and I think that's just such a wonderful model that um, has worked in a lot of places and is currently, there are programs currently internationally uh, looking at that and have been very successful. Um, and I would like to, if possible, request that you share maybe the slides that you presented to us. Um, I would like a little bit more time to look through them um, and, and zoom in and really grasp all the innovation and ideas that um, is being brought to the table. Um, it's a lot to process and um, yeah, I, but just overall great presentation. It's, um, it's, it's just wonderful to see an initiative like this. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, I will share it with Julie and Rachel. And, you know, once you've had a chance to sit with it, if there are precedents or ideas um, in your mind, please send them our way as well. Thank you. Any additional questions? It sounds like we will definitely be inviting, looking forward to you, having you back. Um, so, Winter, Jan, and Rachel, thanks so much for presenting. and. 
Um, and I will um, piggyback on Chris's suggestion that um, if there are things that you feel the city should be doing or that we should be leading on, please um, make sure that we know about it and we can bring you back in. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, our next topic for today is going to be um, the Streets 2035 briefing. And for that, I believe Christine Leon and Matt Burkow are here and perhaps others. Um, so I will um, invite you to um, present as you like to share what's happening on this project. So good evening, Chair uh, Spivak. It's nice to see you and nice to see you, um, Christian members again. I'm Christine Leon. I'm the Development Permitting and Right-of-Way Manager for the Portland Bureau of Transportation. And I'm just going to do a quick intro as to why we're here and then um, kick it off to Matt, who is the program manager extraordinaire on my team in charge of the um, Streets 2035 project as well as some other things. So if I can just get through my intro and then I'll let Matt introduce himself, okay? Um, so what we are uh, doing is we are helping define and shape the city because not everything fits in the public right of way. So as you know that, uh, you know, capital projects and development do define and shape the city. Uh, we do that by applying our standards and our policies to uh, make sure transformations and services are provided. But the right of way doesn't have a prescriptive type of methodology or a model that lets us do that. Uh, we have various policies. We know that the built environment matters and that context matters. And it's our job as managers of the right-of-way space and the transportation system to make sure that we do make the good decisions to apply our tools to, on what to build. So the, again, the Streets 2035 project will allow for a better collaborative decision-making process. We are not setting new policies, but we are balancing existing ones so that we can have a better implementation strategy and the better outcomes. We wanna make sure that decisions are made timely, that we have consistency and that we have safe systems. So we are gonna have um, escalation for common issues to make sure, again, those are gonna be solved systematically. So we're here this evening to uh, share with you what we are uh, doing and the outcomes and to get more feedback, that's my dog, on, uh, <laughs> on our approach and to, to hear from you, um, you know, what things you might be interested in. So thank you. And then uh, thanks, Matt. And we'll take questions uh, at the end. I'll put myself on mute. All right. Thanks, Christine. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Okay. I also have dogs. Um, so ours are welcome at our meetings. Okay, super. I'm going to share my screen and I'll kind of take you through a brief presentation. It's not too long, so we'll leave plenty of time for, for Q and A. All right. Trust you can see this or oh, I didn't hit share yet. Okay. There we go. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so I'm gonna here to tell you about the Streets 2035 project. Um, as Christine mentioned, um, I'm in her group, uh, the Development Permitting and Transit Division at PBOT. Um, that is the group that kind of is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the right-of-way, whether that's issuing street opening permits so the Water Bureau can access their infrastructure uh, or the development review process, which sets our, you know, things like our frontage requirements to construct our sidewalk networks over time. Uh, this project is in collaboration between our division and also our planning uh, division. So again, it's about um, establishing a, a decision-making framework for allocating space in the right of way. And so a little bit about why we need this. So our, comp our comprehensive plan, uh, it kind of establishes functionally that our public rights of way are supposed to provide multiple public services. So from, you know, multiple forms of transportation, managing stormwater, our water distribution centers or systems are underneath the road, private utilities, 
We have policies around tree canopy, tree preservation, active uses of the right of way. And, you know, implementing the policies associated with each of these systems um, is straightforward when there's enough space. Uh, but frequently our right of way is limited. Our streets are, are of limited size. I think our most common street within the city is 36 feet wide curb to curb. So that's, um, it's not very wide. So, you know, how we negotiate, you know, space for multiple modes of transportation or, you know, all of our, our utilities and infrastructure have, util have clearances between each other to, you know, preserve the integrity of their systems. Um, and so this can result in uncertainty both in our development process um, if we have different bureaus who have different policies that they are, you know, trying to implement and in our capital projects. And so that's kind of the why of the project. And, um, you know, I'll just kind of flip through this slide is you know, our rights of way are fixed size and the demands upon them as our city grows is, is increasing. Um, so let's see if I can get this slide to animate. So just, just flipping through all the things that happen in our public rights of way. And, um, you know, when you get down to the details, it can get complicated. So this, this next visual is just another way of, of look, visualizing the things that take place in the, in the public right of way. Um, and again, the public right of way, that's the public space. That's basically from the property line to the property line that would include the sidewalks and the streets, everything that is below them as well. And so this, this image is just color coded by the bureaus that manage the different um, uh, systems in the right of way. So we've got, you know, green for street trees managed by parks and, and rec. The transportation elements are in blue. We've got our sewer and storm systems, private utilities, water. So this just gets a, gives a flavor for, you know, and there's a relationship between what happens above and, and below. And so the approach to the project is it's really in three phases. Uh, the first phase was kind of an existing conditions analysis. I talked a little bit about that, you know, what are our rights of way? How big are how big are the rights of way in different parts of town? It is different in the central city than it is in the southwest than it is in East Portland in terms of the size of our roads. Um, we have convened a multi bureau technical advisory group. We shared, you know, what are the issues that we all encounter when we are carrying out our missions in the right of way, whether that's water delivering water service um, to their customers or whether it's, you know, PBOT trying to make streets safer through safe pedestrian crossings, and maybe they come into um, issues with clearances to underground infrastructure. Um, our, our stormwater systems, our stormwater is managed differently in different parts of town because the soil drains differently. So there's, um, you know, we kind of learned, you know, about each other's uh, processes and, and challenges. And then we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about today about the street types, which is the context for making the decisions because we encounter different issues. And the question is, well, where are we? What type of street, what function does it play in the city? How do we make those decisions? Um, you know, so some of our outcomes are our are, are decision-making tools for our capital projects and development review staff to make consistent decisions, but we're really in the middle part and we have this little change management curve because compromise is hard. Um, and that's kind of the phase that we are in. So to give a sense of some of the issues and, and some of the, um, as they relate to the, the, the right of way functions. So uh, we have the Bureau of Planning Sustainability on our advisory group. So you'll see that our, our street typologies that is, in, is a, a classification in our TSP called the street design classification is tightly linked with the comprehensive plan concept of corridors and center, which is what organizes uh, the growth in our city. Um, you know, the Water Bureau is, is often concerned about, you know, they're generally day-to-day -day maintaining old pipes and they're concerned about, you know, protecting the integrity of their infrastructure. So the clearances to above ground infrastructure, like I mentioned, trans, uh, crossings or infrastructure that improves transit priority, speed and reliability. Um, Portland Parks and Rec, tree preservation. Sometimes when, when we implement new sidewalks through development, there may be an existing mature tree there and, and there can be conflicts between preserving a tree and implementing a, a sidewalk. Uh, clearances to utilities, to vaults in the right of way. Again, I talked a little bit about stormwater management. Um, and uh, again, Bureau of Transportation is thinking about how we implement our strategy for people movement, um, implementing our sidewalk standards. So all of these various, um, you know, implementation issues as, as Christine was mentioning. So the, the, we came up with four objectives for this project. So it is developing a context sensitive decision making framework to guide space allocation in the right of way again when space is limited. So at the highest level, 
we want to achieve the citywide and individual bureau goals. We are not setting new policies. We have we have good policies around again around sidewalks and safety and delivering water and preserving trees. And the question is, when we can't meet all the policies in a development situation or a capital project, how do we make those decisions? Ideally, we reduce the, situ the situations that require individual interpretation and inter-bureau negotiation. All of this will help us ideally create uh, increased certainty for people wishing to develop in and adjacent to the right of way. Again, when we can sort of speak as one city and kind of bring the different policy priorities together and to create a consistent starting point for our capital projects design. So just to make it a little bit more real, um, this slide kind of focuses on the pedestrian zone. So, you know, the sidewalks. So we have sidewalk standards that are established in our pedestrian design guide. Again, a lot of our sidewalks are implemented through the development process. Uh, we have access requirements, be they driveways or, or some you know, larger developments require on-site loading. We have policies around creating uh, tree planting sites and also preserving existing trees. You know, utilities have clearances from each other, from trees, from different things. And so when you get to actually implementing um, a given standard, like for example, a sidewalk standard, you may encounter existing infrastructure. Maybe that existing infrastructure is a, is a mature tree like we see here. We may have limited right of way. We may have topography, which effectively limits the amount of space we have to work with. And so just to think about how we might use context to make decisions, in, in this instance on the, in the upper right, you've got a, you know, a large tree on uh, you know, a local street, a curb tight sidewalk. Curb tight sidewalks do not meet our, our current standards. Our standard sidewalk has a four foot furnishing zone where trees will be planted. And then you have the pedestrian through zone. So this was, you know, this is a curb tight non-standard sidewalk. And if it would, if it met our trigger for redevelopment, we would have them, you know, reconstruct the sidewalk to meet current standards. In this case, you know, the you're beside a, a, a low volume local street with on street parking next to it, you know, the buffer function of the sidewalk to, you know, buffer pedestrians from the adjacent roadway. And you, know, you could say, well, it's, it, we wouldn't really want to, you know, move the sidewalk over and take out this tree. We can bend the sidewalk around that tree. If we look at the, the example on the bottom, you know, this is one of our civic corridors, you know, one of the streets that is, uh, you know, zoned for growth and change. And, you know, does it make sense to keep this sidewalk adjacent to a busy, fast moving road, you know, where we, you know, where you have a transit stop right next to the road, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the trees next to the road to provide shade. So in this case, you know, we would, you know, most likely come to the decision to require the standard sidewalk. So these decisions get made today, but the question is, can we create consistency in how we make them? So we make the same decisions, um, you know, with context in mind. When we think about what's happening between the curbs, you know, we're asking about, you know, the consistency of our plans for the different modes of transportation, um, who has priority for the curb, you know, this, you know, can transit and, and bicycles share space for an intermittent amount of time when space is constrained. <clears throat> I talked a little bit about the relationship between the above ground infrastructure and the below ground infrastructure. So things like to make our streets more multimodal, safer, things like median crossings, bus islands that allow the bus to stop in the lane and have a level landing for uh, people with disabilities, um, you know, swales to manage stormwater. And, you know, one of the issues, like I said, when we think about constrained and narrow roadways, this is an instance where the road is big enough that the bike lane was able to jog around um, the swale, the stormwater swale. But as we, if we want to think more sort of methodically, we want to make sure that we don't install swales in places where we now need a transit priority treatment to get buses unstuck from traffic and, and you know, operating, um, you know, on schedule and a good experience for people who rely upon on transit. So to, to speak a little bit to the context piece of this, I mentioned that our street design classification in our TSP, this is a classification that already exists. Um, these are maps are from the from the comp plan. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the the growth in you know centers and corridors. So on the left we have the civic corridors in red, which are the larger streets like 122nd Avenue, Foster Powell, 82nd, Sandy, MLK, BH Highway, things like that. And then the neighborhood corridors are the smaller roads, Division and Belmont, Alberta, Killingsworth, things like that. And so we have in our street design classifications, we also have 
civic and neighborhood corridors that align with them. So this is a vocabulary for our streets because again, we have tree and sidewalk issues that come up routinely, but the question is, what, are we, what tools do we have to use context to help us make you know, the right decision in the right place? Um, I kind of brought up this map. I'm not sure if you guys are aware. We, our, our transportation system plan has an online version of it and it has an interactive map. So if you just Google uh, Portland's TSP, I'm not gonna click on it, but the street design classifications, you can, you can basically um, see the different networks for all of our modes of transportation, including the street design. So in this case, I had turned on those larger streets, the civic and neighborhood corridors. Um, and you could, you know, we also have, maybe it would be helpful for you guys to just understand the context if I brought up um, a couple of the other classifications so you can see how they're different. Let's see if I can get this to launch. Slowly, my home internet is evidently not that fast. And maybe I'll just take you through it a little bit in uh, myself. So I mentioned the civic, the civic corridors and main streets. These are the larger roads. The neighborhood corridors and main streets are those next ones down. Those are all again zoned for for growth. Um, our community corridors. Uh, those are our collector streets, right? Those are streets that are kind of residentially zoned adjacent to them. Like you could think of maybe Northeast 15th Avenue. They provide a kind of a, a strong mobility function, but they do not have this, the level of zoning um, to accommodate growth like the civic and neighborhood corridors. And then we have many hundreds of miles, actually probably something like 1500 miles of local streets, um, which have, you know, sort of fewer demands upon them. Um, you know, they don't have transit running down them. They don't need separated bikeways. Um, good opportunities for things like surface stormwater because um, they're unlikely to conflict with, with mobility priorities. Um, so basically what we're hoping to do with this project is for each of the street uh, classifications that I mentioned on the previous slide, we'll have kind of graphics like these that really just um, help set the vision for what these streets are kind of aspiring to and the role they play in our system. And, and some of the sample outcomes, so again, really kind of elevating um, street design classification as, a, as, the, as the sort of tool for policy resolution in limited space as, as the context. Um, we want to clarify design exceptions for investments that improve safety, accessibility, and mobility. Again, things like the median crossings and transit bulbs. And again, when you think about um, our partners in the right of way, you know, to the Water Bureau or to you know urban forestry, they don't necessarily know the function that these streets may be playing in our mobility systems, how that's tied to land use. So again, giving us ourselves a vocabulary that there are certain streets that are priorities for transit treatments for that are on our Vision Zero network to, to improve safety. So again, things we do now that we wanna just do more consistently and more smoothly. Um, again, I, I talked about um, you know, alternatives to our standard sidewalk to preserve a tree. So within our development review process, there are a myriad of situations that might come up where there is kind of an obstacle uh, or a potential obstacle to our standard sidewalk. So just clarifying, you know, where we can be flexible in the sidewalk and, and, and where the really standard sidewalk needs to prevail. Um, we're looking for opportunities to minimize the impacts of transformer vaults in the right of way that are impacting things like tree planting spaces. Um, they, they can impact how the space for water and, and sewer connections into private buildings, um, where we're kind of creating a space for our underground partners who sometimes run into um, clearance issues from, from each other, from them, themselves, so to sort out how those decisions can best be made. And so with that, you know, I think one of the questions was how, how are we involving um, um, the public in this process? And we are primarily using our citizen advisory committee structure um, so we've been to the Urban Forestry Commission multiple times. We've been to our Development Review Advisory Committee, um, to the Bike and Pet Advisory Committee. We've been to our Planning and Development Directors several times and to individual bureau directors who we may need to, you know, if, the, if, if as we're kind of getting into these hard conversations, we need a little help to, to encourage people to compromise. Um, so with that, I think I'm gonna open it up to questions. The project in terms of a schedule, um, 
was slated to be, you know, kind of about a two and a half year project. So that would have been having it kind of finishing in 2021 COVID with city staff furloughs and just like the challenges of working remotely, I would say we're going to probably go into 2022 um, to finish it. Um, but we do have a, an email address and a website and I'm happy to um, take some questions. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I see, there we go. So I, if you could maybe help me out for a moment and not share a screen for just a second, that'll help Absolutely. me if these hands are up, great. Um, so Oriana, you've got a question and then after that, Valeria. Yeah, I wanted to start just with a comment uh, and naming that the use of the word citizen and citizen advisory committee, uh, I would advise using a community uh, advisory committee instead just to be conscious that there may be folks who participate who are not, not necessarily citizens. Uh, but the question is, uh, why take the approach of kind of focusing on, on the committees rather than broader community engagement around this particular issue? And then after the right of way planning uh, is, is developed, how will community be engaged in terms of how you weight uh, what a particular community wants to see in terms of valuing trees or bioswales versus transit? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. And I, and I don't think that we're in any way trying to say that one of those is valued, you know, over another one. I think the I think that the reason for the community advisory committees was, you know, we're not, we're not creating a new tree policy, right? We're not creating new pedestrian policies. We're kind of saying, here's how, here's the challenges. Here's when these policies kind of run into each other and there's not space to meet all the policies. And so it was, it was a way to make sure that the, I mean, that they are there, the advisory bodies around each of those kind of priorities. And so that was the, the we were trying to take advantage of the existing structure around these different, um, like I said, these different sort of functional uses of the right of way. And so I think as we, as we get to some of the, um, some of the, some of the outcomes are going to be tied together on a website. And so we'll include things like trying articulating sort of the functional, um, you know, sort of priorities of the different types of streets, right? Certain streets are more important for transit based on, you know, the civic corridors versus, you know, a community corridor that, that does an on our transit network and just trying, so there, there will be opportunities for that level of input as the, as the tools are developed, but that was, that was the approach that we were taking. Thanks. Um, Valeria? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Feel free, feel free to push back on this question, um, but I just thought I'd ask, um, is there, you think, uh, I'm just thinking all these sort of um, improvements, infrastructure improvements in communities are great, um, yet at the same time, some of these increased property values, um, as they should be, right? Um, and so has there been any discussion about potential anti-displacement strategies um, before having, you know, now that you know sort of like where some of these projects are going to be, um, sort of to Oriana's point in the involvement of the committee um, that lives in um, around those sort of topics, like I don't have a solution, but that's something that is like I have in my mind as a question. Right, um, and maybe you add to your list of you know the anti-displacement task force that the city currently has as, as another sounding board of sort of these projects and how um, yeah how we sort of um, navigate those kind of questions. Again, I don't have the answers. I just know that you know, um, or we have housing that's already very unaffordable, um, and so doing that. <laughs> you know, with speculation and with um, adding some of these improvements, like we want to make sure that, um, yeah, we take that into consideration. So um, just just food for thought. Yeah, that, that's that's good food for thought. Um, you know, I think in, you know, in a, in a, I don't think that the Streets 2035 will necessarily, you know, give the answer. I think you're getting into some bigger questions of like, um, you know, we, we require sidewalks through development to serve people who, who use it. And so I don't think we're, 
I mean, I like the recommendation of, of checking in with the task force, um, you know, and in, in a capital project development, again, this context of saying, oh, well, where are we and what is the role of this street in the city? That is not saying, therefore, there's no need for community involvement with this project, right? It is trying to just create a consistency in, in how the projects are thinking about context in, in resolving things. But those, those, are, that's a, those are great points. I'm gonna go to Chris and then I'm gonna jump in myself and then Dr. Oriana, Chris. Uh, so my question was very similar to Oriana's. I'm curious why there's no broader whole community outreach of this. And I wonder if you might want to check in with the citizen involvement committee or sorry, the community involvement committee. Um, uh, you know, because we, we do have a set of policies around this and they're kind of the, the custodians of best practice. Um, so it seems to me there's a hole there. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit on that line as well. I. Um, because I, I, I'm trying to understand this. I, first of all, I'm excited this project is happening because we have these policies which do conflict sometimes with each other. So the first step we've already gone through is to identify where the conflicts happen, um, where our, our, um, our streets are oversubscribed, where we have 120 feet of stuff you want to put into 60 feet of right of way. Um, but I also think that if we're wrestling with those situations, we are effectively making policy. I mean, there are going to be winners and losers, I think, if we're not, we don't have enough space to fit what we do. And then it becomes this tug of war, you know, between freight, pedestrians, transit, bikes, civil engineers, utilities, trees, all these things are competing for that stuff. And I would just hope that there'd be some public process. Um, I, I don't know who arbitrates that, like who makes the decision when things are competing. And my hope is that it's not, frankly, just a technical advisory committee. That, that, you know, it's a bigger picture stuff as you opened in your slide, it's comp plan stuff. Um, what are our city's priorities? And if those are surfacing in this project, which I think they inevitably have to because there's more uses. We, we, we've written policies to put more stuff in the right of way than we have room for. So I really hope that the decision on how to do triage between those different priorities has public involvement in it because it impacts a lot of public factors. Um, so I'm, I'm really hopeful that like the website gets updated, people, people can see what's happening. I mean, I knew, I learned about this project happenstance from someone who you know, learned about it two years ago. Um, and so I think we're hitting it at a good time where you're already starting to identify the, the conflicts um, that are within our own city policies. Um, and I just really hope that there's a way that, that um, maybe you can answer who, who, makes, who makes the call on this um, if, if there's, you just don't have enough room to fit things. So maybe I'll leave that with the question, who makes the call? And my hope is that the answer is it doesn't go all the way to city council and then it's already baked in at that point. Yeah, and I think, I think, uh... Did you want to say something, Christine? No, I was just going to say that's a great question. That is why we're here, because those those trade-off decisions happen every day, and they've been happening every year on our projects. And the, the Bureau of Transportation is the responsible steward for the right-of-way. And so we have, I think, to kind of reassert our position of the chief engineer and the city engineer in that space, because someone has to make the final decision. Um, we want to make sure that there are clearances provided for the bureaus, for the utilities, that everything flows to the right of way, and we need to provide that space for them. For you know, development decisions, those are uh, similar to capital projects, they're happening every day. I know our appeals process has public involvement in that um, alternative standards. For capital projects, we definitely rely on the building through the involvement of the people um, out in the community when they are designing the cross section. So it's, it's different paths, um, but that is a great question. And again, what part of why we are here and doing this project. Thank you. Thanks for being here too. Um, I'll go to Oriana and then Valeria. I just want to amplify the point that Eli made that even if this project isn't intended to value or make decisions, that's still ultimately an outcome that comes through through these conversations. And I don't know that I'm completely satisfied with the answer around community involvement because I think having clear processes is important. I was thinking to build off of Valeria's earlier point uh, about the like gentrifying neighborhood and expectations or needs for like white gentrifiers versus like lower income BIPOC folks in the community. And uh, I do a lot of work in the Cully neighborhood. I'm thinking about that in particular. There are a lot of streets that don't even have sidewalks yet. So we're not even, you know, 
far down the road, uh, no pun intended in terms of what, um, what like other things can be built in or it has to be a holistic process. Um, so I guess the, the question, uh, it's maybe more of a point than a question, so I apologize there, but is, is to just better understand like where are the points where you could push yourself a little bit because the Albina vision showed us what participatory action research looks like in the community in a way that a community is visioning and rating different values. And that seems like an approach that uh, to Winter's point earlier about like advocating for that kind of approach more, it seems like that might be employed here. So I guess the I, question is how can you be more creative in terms of how community is engaged? Because I think there's a lot of privilege around the people you are engaging and not the people who are going to be most impacted. Already? Um, I was curious, is there, I didn't see a budget included in this presentation and just wondering in terms of, for example, the right, at, um, right away acquisition, is there a, an annual, like how does that process work and what the budget looks like either year to year or for this specific program? For right away, I think, so this is, to, okay, look, for generally speaking, you know, when there is a, when there is a capital project, right? How, how right away is how the city acquires right away. It's rare that a capital project acquires right away because it's very expensive or it would, it's, it's property that's owned by somebody else. You know, the typical way that right away is, um, is acquired is if through, through a redevelopment of a project of a, of a development site, right? If today there is a nine foot sidewalk, and the standard is a 12 foot sidewalk so that you can sort of have an adequate through zone and space for trees and whatnot. Um, the city will require three feet of property dedication to construct the sidewalk to meet standards. So that's the general way in which that happens. Um, that's yeah. that's a helpful clarification. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if, yeah, if the city was even acquiring, because yeah, the, it is quite expensive. And yeah. also wanted to be mindful that, you know, where we would be putting that money, like in which areas of the city would offer. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Are there additional questions? Okay, I would like to, um, I'll toss up one more, one more thought is that we, and we've just gone through this whole process with DOZA, um, which is design overlay zone assessment, where we have this elaborate um, public involvement, um, code writing process, um, recommending to city council, where is that right now, to figure out um, public realm um, and other factors for what's built on private property. Um, and so I'm optimistic that we can have some level of process for the other side of the line, you know, um, which also has obviously even more of a public realm than on the private side. So I, I will invite you guys um, to um, perhaps an officer's meeting to sort of see if there's ways that we can, um, um, if there's a role for us beyond just a briefing um, and, um, and perhaps an introduction to the citizen, um, sorry, community about in the CIC, someone tell me how it's, what it stands for, um, community involvement committee um, to, um, to see if, if there's any way we can assist with, with the public um, involvement in the project. Yeah, that would be great, Eli. I know um, that CIC is an advisory body to, I think, BPS and maybe BDS. Um, so Courtney will help us get to the right person um, to talk about, um, you know, what what's the opportunity there for us. Um, and I also just want to make sure that it's understood. We we don't have a specific project, like we don't have a capital project or a development project with the streets 2035. It's really a framework of um, allocating space to and using this street classification. Uh, terminology that is not well used today. So again, we're, we're, we're trying to um, be more effective in our decisions so that things are not one-offs, that they are more transparent that, that, I mean, for people outside the city as well as in the bureaus. So yeah, there's not a specific like capital project that we're building with this, with this tool. So we really appreciate coming here and your feedback. Um, I think it's it's really helpful to hear what uh, would interest you and how you can help guide and shape the work that we're we're doing. So I'll stay connected with Courtney um, and then Eli on um, how to get to the CIT. Thank you so much. Thanks for participating. I'm glad you're doing the project and um, 
we'll look forward to staying in touch. Thank you guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good luck in your future, Chris. <laughs> um, well, with that, um, that's our last agenda item for today. So I will say that thank you everyone for participating and listening in and our meeting is adjourned. Good night. Hi, Chris.